live captioning. So with that, I'd like to introduce our, our presenter tonight. We've got Dr. Uh, Abby Vandenberg. We're excited to have her and uh, she's got a great presentation planned. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a part of a, a series that we're running from UVM Extension through the middle of December. Uh, we've just got the schedule up here so you can see uh, upcoming sessions on sugar bush and sugar house leases, a uh, session later in September on sap yields and tapping brown wood. We've got a variety of things coming up for uh, late September through December, and that schedule will hit our website really in the coming weeks as we get our registration set up. So invite you to keep going back to maplemanager.org for coming events, and you can see that. Here's the website. Thanks, Abby, for clicking through. <laughs> we can be moving. Uh, Check it out. Uh, we've got the schedule for this webinar series, and then we'll have a, a growing number of business planning tools, uh, business calculators, and forestry resources hitting this website over the next year and a half. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Vandenberg. Thanks for presenting tonight, Abby. We're glad to have you. Thanks, Mark. Sorry if I clicked too, too soon on that. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, welcome to my home. <laughs> so tonight's presentation is going to be on tapping practices to optimize both sustainability and yield. And it's a pretty big topic, so hope we're going to get to a lot tonight. Uh, but before I get started, I do want to mention that even though I'm the one up here talking or out here in cyberspace talking, uh, I'm going to present a lot of research tonight. Um, this is not just research that I've done myself. This is research that's been done by the entire Proctor team and crew, Dr. Timothy Perkins, Mark Iselhart, and the rest of the crew. So a lot of work went into what I'm presenting tonight, not just work that I did by myself. So, all right. So to kind of set the stage for everything here, um, we all know that when we tap a tree for sap collection, we have a couple of things that happen. We know that the tree's response to that wound is going to generate a column of wood above and below the tap hole that is permanently non-conductive to sap and also water transport for the tree. We also know that we're removing a portion of the tree's sugar or carbohydrate reserves. Uh, but at the same time, you know, those are two sort of taking away, but there's also the, the putting back. So we know that the tree is going to replenish some of those carbohydrate reserves uh, through photosynthesis during the growing season. And we also know that the tree is going to add new conductive wood, uh, in particular to the tapping zone of the tree, um, each year during its radial growth. So it's kind of a balance of sort of uh, taking away and putting back. And so the big topic of the talk tonight is sustainability. And a big question is, well, what do I mean when I say sustainable or sustainability? And there are a ton of different definitions for sustainable in different contexts and even in the context of uh, maple production. But we can start to think about it if we just set up the framework for this um, by looking at this very, very general sort of setup framework for how we look at uh, tapping and sap selection. If we set it up that way, we can define sustainable sap collection as a condition where we have the addition of new conductive wood by the tree outpacing the amount of non-conductive wood that we're adding by tapping. And also along the same lines that the amount of conductive wood in the tapping zone remains relatively high over time. So literally like the opposite of this. Um, and that actually gives us sustainability or something we can call sustainability from two different standpoints. It gives us sustainability from the standpoint of tree health. So having a lot of, non uh, a lot of conductive wood will um, make sure that the tree has a functional water transport system, a relatively low risk of disease or decay, um, and basically good health. And then it also gives us a condition of sustainability in terms of our yield. So the higher the percentage of conductive wood in the tree over time, the higher the probability that we're going to tap into nice, clean, conductive wood when we tap. But this will ultimately give us a condition of sustainability for yield, not just tree health. And if we set it up this way, the big important thing to remember 
is that it's the tree's diameter growth or radial growth rates that underlie the sustainability of both uh, tree health and yield in terms of our tapping practices. Literally, radial growth rates are sort of the pivot point that all of this hinges upon because we're um, depending on the amount of conductive wood being added. And in addition to that, radial growth rates are basically like the ultimate indicator of tree health. So anything that happens to the tree is whether it's negative or positive is going to be reflected in how well it's growing radially or adding diameter. So it really is sort of the pivot point, the key that all of this hinges upon. And so with that said, where we can start with is, well, what do we know about the impact of tapping on tree radial growth? Um, and so one of the first uh, studies that we did to kind of get at that question um, we wanted to just see, well, what are the growth rates of trees that are tapped with the sap collection practices that we're using now? And now means 2010 when we did the study, so it's been a little while. So for this study, we collected increment cores from a really large number of trees that were in, uh, and they were all healthy, co-dominant or dominant in the canopy, um, and they were at 18 sites across Vermont that had been using uh, what were at the time relatively high yield sap collection practices for at least the past five years. We then uh, measured the growth rates of those trees and used them to calculate the average growth rate over the past five years when we knew those practices had been used. And so what this gave us was this graph right here. So the overall average growth rates for the six diameter classes that we looked at across all of those 18 different sites. <coughs> Excuse me. And really what this tells us, um, honestly, is not very much. I mean, I can compare it to growth rates measured in sugar maple at other sites and other studies um, and say that it, they're, they're pretty similar. But as far as telling us something about, well, what do these growth rates mean in terms of whether they're good enough to be sustainable for sap collection, they really don't tell us anything. Um, so we need to do another step to kind of put these numbers into some kind of context for what do they mean for sustainable uh, maple production. So to do that, uh, to give these numbers, these growth rates some context, what we did was we used a model of the tapping zone of a tree and we used it to estimate what are the minimum growth rates required to maintain that really high proportion of conductive wood over time, which we already uh, called, we decided was sustainable, that really high level of conductive wood over time when standard tapping practices were used. And we were looking at uh, fairly standard tapping practices, two inch depth, a 5 16 inch spout, and a 30 inch drop line. And those um, estimated minimums are the bars in blue. So when we marry those two data sets together and compare the growth rates that we measured with the minimum estimates that we made, we can see that broadly speaking, on average, um, the growth rates, the average growth rates of our trees tapped with these current sap collection practices were generally higher than the minimum that we estimated they needed to be for tapping to be sustainable. So, you know, on first pass, big picture, that's some pretty reassuring news. <laughs> it's good to know. And generally speaking, uh, that is kind of reassuring. However, you know, there were many, many trees that went into these six averages. So lots and lots of individual trees. So while the average reflected this story, what we found was when we drilled down to look at some of the individual tree data, um, the story was a lot more complex than this nice kind of reassuring picture. And this is really no surprise to anyone. And I apologize. I know Mark Canella is uh, cringing right now. I apologize for putting this uh, table up with lots of numbers, but I'm doing it to highlight a pretty simple point. Basically, when we look at the actual growth rates at the individual sites, so these are the average growth rates of trees that are 18 different sites in all of those different size classes. So if we just focus in on the 10 inch trees at those different sites, 
you can see even at looking uh, from site A to site B, for example, the growth rates are double of one another. So there's a huge amount of variation in the growth rates of trees, both between sites and actually within trees of the same size at the same site. And that's something that all of you that work in the woods already know and have experienced on your own. The growth rates of trees can vary vastly in the same stand, often for a reason that is not entirely obvious. So lots of variation in individual growth rates of trees. And what that translated into is that when we looked and put the individual tree data in that same model, we found that between 27 and 41 percent of the individual trees that made up those big averages actually had growth rates that were not uh, meeting the estimated minimum. So these are the percentage of individual trees below the estimated minimum growth rates for that greater than 90% conductive wood. So that is a lot of trees not making the cut. So somewhat of a different picture than what the overall averages showed us. So I'm gonna come back to that in a minute or in, later on in the presentation. So just hold that thought for a moment. The other uh, study that we have been looking at, uh, so basically in this study here, it gave us a lot of great information and is very useful for a lot of reasons, but we were trying to look back in time to understand what was happening now, and there's a lot of difficulties in doing that, but really, if we want to answer this very fundamental question, how does or does tapping and sap collection impact radial growth of trees, what we really need to do is have an actual controlled experiment where we start with trees that have never been tapped and are in the same stand and are exactly alike in every other way until we start to tap some of them and leave some of them as controls. That's really the only way that we can effectively answer that question. And at the time when we started this next study, it had not really been done before, um, in part because it's very, very difficult to do. But to try and address that question, we did set up an experiment like that um, in 2013 at the Proctor Center. So you can see we had a single stand that had never been tapped, about 100 trees, and we split them into three different treatments. So a third of the trees remained as controls, so were never to be tapped. Another third were set up to be tapped with gravity sap collection methods, so basically hanging a bucket on a tree. And the other third were set up to be tapped and sap collected uh, with high vacuum levels. And so you can see here, um, this is a, all the different colored squares and circles indicate the different treatments. So all the treatments are interspersed among the whole stand and everything is equal for uh, size and everything. But what we do, of course, we measure the yield from our tap trees each year in the study so that we can quantify exactly how much of the sugar reserves that we're taking out. But the more important part of the study is that we are measuring the diameter of the trees each year so that we can see if diameter growth rate is affected or uh, different in the trees that are tapped versus the control. And so we started this in 2013 which means that so far uh, we have six years of growth data for these trees. Um, what you can see here <clears throat> are the average diameter of all the trees in each of the three treatments from the beginning to up to now or last fall. Um, these are the untapped control trees, these are the gravity sap collection trees, and these are the vacuum sap collection trees. So just Taking a step back and looking at these um, different bars for the different treatments, you can see that all of the trees and all the treatments are growing and they're growing pretty much identically to one another. So um, no big differences coming out there, obviously. If we look at the percentage growth of the trees from the beginning of the study to now, uh, we can see that in terms of percent, the control trees and the gravity trees have grown 11.7%, while the trees in the vacuum sap collection treatment have grown 10.8%. So this is um, less than a one percentage point difference, 
And from a mathematical scientific standpoint, that doesn't count as a difference. It's not statistically significant in part because there's a lot of variation in all of the growth uh, for all the trees and all the treatments. So although I can look at this right now and say, there is no difference, there is no effect, this is the kind of thing that perhaps it's a small difference today at year six, and it is something that at year 16 might actually turn out to be a significant difference. And that's why this kind of study is uh, by necessity, a long-term study. So uh, even 10 years in a, a maple production type study is not even a long-term study. So we do need to continue to follow this for a while and hopefully I'll be around to um, report those results to you as they come out. Um, so this study gives us a lot of really good information. It has one tiny drawback and that is that ideally, you know, we know as people that work in the woods that the one of the biggest impacts on how trees grow is the site and soil on which they're growing. And this study is only being done at one site and it happens to not be a particularly good site for sugar maple growth to begin with. Um, and this is something that we all intuitively know, site is very, very important. But this is highlighted by um, some of the work done by Dr. Bume and his colleagues that have found consistently, um, have shown consistently how important soil and site fertility is to sugar maple growth. And in this study in particular, although they found no consistent relationship between growth and tapping, they, it did have some indication that soil fertility could play a role, that if tapping was going to have an effect on growth rates, it was more likely to be seen on sites of lower quality. So looking at how tree growth is affected um, is really important to take site into consideration. So um, after we initiated that first study, we were able to expand the study in 2017 to 15 different sites across Vermont and a little bit of New York. Um, so that it's the same basic setup. We have 50 trees at each site, again, trying to get a range of site qualities and a range of different growing conditions to test this in. Um, half the trees at each site do not get tapped. Half of them are tapped as, uh, as they would be by the producer. You know, unfortunately, we can't measure uh, yield in this study, but we do measure each year diameter growth, crown condition, and right now we have funding through six years and we of course hope to be continuing that study over the long term so that we can have a more robust answer to the question, how does or does tapping and sap collection impact radio, radio growth? So at, with that, that is a big stay tuned for more data on the answers to those particular questions. So moving on, how do the growth rates our tapping practices, the yields that we get, factors that have to do with the tree, and the big word sustainability. How do these all interplay and interact to affect what we do and what we get? So the first thing that we can look at is the simplest, and that is, you know, you didn't need to come to a presentation on a Wednesday night to know this. Our tapping practices, the tapping practices that we choose, impact the yields that we get. You know, this is not rocket science. But what is important to do is, you know, we all intuitively know that our tapping practices impact yields, but to be able to put numbers and to quantify the impact of those various tapping practices allows us to make better decisions, to make quantitative decisions um, on the tapping practices that we choose. And so this is a good starting place. So. First and foremost, we know that tap hole depth is probably one of the tapping practices that can have the biggest impact on yield. And again, something that we all intuitively know, um, deeper tap holes tend to result in greater yields. That's a pretty much of a no-brainer. But how much, right? So this is a, a these are results of a three-year study done at Proctor. And they're being presented, so a three-year study looking at tap hole depth and the yield from different tap hole depths. And the results are being presented as the percent of the yield of a one and a half inch tap hole. 
So a one and a half tap inch tap hole is set to 100%. So compare that to the yield from a one inch tap hole, we see 63% of yield from a one inch tap hole that we do from a one and a half inch tap hole. So quantitatively speaking, that's a pretty substantial reduction in yield going from one and a half inches to one inch. So um, a, big, a, a big reduction there. However, once we increase above one and a half inches, it basically flatlines. We see almost no difference in the increase in yield that we're getting once we go above one and a half inches. So compared to two inches, um, going to two and a quarter, two and a half, we're really not getting any more sap while we're also creating much more non-conductive wood. So uh, in terms of tap hole depth and yield, we really see that yes, you get greater yield generally with zebra tap holes, but only up to a point. And perhaps not, this is something that we might not expect just intuitive based on what we know intuitively. So another big practice that has an impact on yield is of course the diameter of the spout that we choose. And again, these are results from studies at the Proctor Center and looking at the percent of sap yield um, relative to a 5 16th inch tap hole. So you can see that there's a pretty linear decrease in yield as you decrease spout diameter. And um, the big one to focus in on is that there's about a 10% reduction going from 5 16th inch to quarter inch. And these studies are done using the same spout material, equal attention to leak checking. So basically all conditions being equal, there is a reduction in yield with smaller tap holes. And that is also at high vacuum levels too. And this is something that we have seen and it's actually in kind of a rare occurrence, like this hardly ever happens in science, Center eights are found almost exactly the same thing um, doing a very similar study. They found an 11.5% difference going from 5 16 to quarter inch. So this is a pretty consistent result across different studies done by different people in different places. Um, so this is a result that I feel fairly confident in saying that is a, that is a consistent one you're going to see in this field if you're doing using the same spout material, equal attention to leak checking. And then finally, and I think this was all a question in one of our pre-questions that we got from the audience tonight, the number of taps per tree can influence the yields that we get. Generally speaking, we see or know that yields can increase with a number of taps per tree. Um, and this is the most recent study that we've done on this at the Proctor Center, where we're looking at yields from one tap versus two taps. So um, here are the results from 2019, the 2019 season, the yields from a single tap tree versus yields from trees with two taps. And so you can see that the trees with two taps on average had a slightly or a, a, an improved yield relative to one tap. And you can see that the yields from the two different tap holes were relatively equally split from one another, which is kind of cool. But then if you fast forward to 2020, there was essentially no difference in the yield with a one tap tree versus two tap trees. And so what we are seeing is that particularly with higher levels of vacuum and also with, uh, depending on tree diameter, but there is an increased tendency for one tap hole to cannibalize sap from the other at higher vacuum levels. So the higher the vacuum is, the smaller the tree is, the more likely that that's gonna happen, and the lower the bump you'll get from adding that second tap. So in general, um, with higher vacuum and smaller tree diameters, you may not see much of a gain um, in adding that second tap, which is good to know. All right, so that kind of brings us to the end of that. We know that deeper, uh, bigger diameter tap holes and more taps per tree are certainly in most cases going to give us higher yields, but we also know that each of those is going to result in more non-conductive wood being added to the tapping zone of our tree. And that brings us to sort of part two.
our tapping practices, of course, impact the amount of non-conductive wood that's in the tree at any given time. So how much? Again, this is about putting numbers on things. So we know that the volume of non-conductive wood added by a tap hole is generally proportional to the volume of the hole. So bigger, uh, bigger tap hole, uh, more uh, volume of non-conductive wood. Um, one of the challenges in putting a number on this is that it's extremely variable from tree to tree and even within a tree. So from our work, we see that it's about 50 times the volume of the hole, but we see, again, it's highly variable. The minimum in that study was 14 times and the maximum was almost 200 times. Um, and that, you know, so that kind of highlights how just variable it can be. And I'm sure you've all seen this over time in the course of doing your work, so you can have a tree like this. Um, these are two inch wide cookies from the tree. This is cut straight through the tap hole. And so you can see that going up from that tap hole, within four inches, that stain is gone. There's no more stain and same with below the tap hole. So four inches above and below, there's no more stain. Then you have a very similar sized tree. I couldn't fit it on one line. So here is the tap hole. And you can follow that tap hole stain up to 12 inches above the tap hole, and it's not even gone yet. And the stain below the tap hole, we're up to 14 inches and it's not gone yet. From the surface, these are trees about the same size. There's uh, none of them hit other stain, which is something that can make things uh, uh, be very different or react very differently. There's essentially no reason for these two trees to develop different levels of non-conductive wood, but they did. So it's essentially very, very difficult to predict that from the outside looking at a tree. And then of course, as I just alluded to, if a tap hole hits or comes even kind of nearby an area of internal staining, either a previous tap hole or a branch scar or the central column of discolored wood or heartwood, uh, the amount of stain generated significantly it really, really increases. It just explodes. And actually, you can kind of see how this happens here. It's this tap hole didn't even go into or touch that central area, but the two areas were close enough that the staining and the reaction of the tree actually interacted. So this is something that definitely can happen and something to keep in mind. And I'll skip these. I, I put these in here also to show how far away the tapple can be from another stain and still that interaction can happen. So the things going on inside the tree, they're often uh, way more complicated than we were even thinking about. So that, okay, so we know that the tapping practices we choose impact how much non-conductive wood we're adding. So now we can look at how our tapping practices impact the chances that we hit that non-conductive wood when we tap. And so if we look at the tapping zone of a tree and we're, well, we're thinking of this uh, on a tubing collection system, this works for a bu bucket system too, but it's slightly different geometry. So for now, we'll just think about a tubing collection system. <clears throat> so if we look, uh, think, of the tapping zone of a tree as being the area of the tree that's accessible by the drop line. And then if you can kind of just imagine unfolding that part of the tree so that it's actually just a rectangle like this, it becomes a lot more simple to think about. And what's important to understand about this is that the total volume of the tapping zone, basically the, the dimensions of the tapping zone are defined in part by the practices that we choose. So, you know, the width of the tapping zone is defined by the tree circumference, how big the tree is. But the height is determined by something that we set up, the length of the drop line. And the same with the depth of the tapping zone, it's defined by what we choose, the tapping depth. And so, these factors, these dimensions, determine the total volume of the tapping zone. And it's that total volume of wood there that is the maximum potential amount of conductive wood that we have available for tapping. So that's kind of part one. 
we already talked about the second part of this, and that is that our tapping practices are what determine the total volume of non-conductive wood added annually. We know the bigger the hole that we make, the spout size, the depth that we choose, is gonna determine how much non-conductive wood we add, and therefore it is us determining how much non-conductive wood is in the tapping zone. And if we put these two things together, what we can see looking at it this way is the proportion of the tapping zone that is non-conductive wood is actually equivalent to the chance of hitting that non-conductive wood when we're tapping. Uh, so for example, if 20% of the tapping zone is non-conductive wood, there's a 20% chance of hitting non-conductive wood when we tap. Of course, that's assuming that we're tapping randomly, which is an assumption, we can talk about that later, but I like to keep things simple. And looking at it simply, we can distill it down into 20% of the tapping zone non-conductive, 20% chance of hitting it. As the non-conductive wood accumulates and the percentages accumulate, the chances of hitting it increase. So if you've got 50% non-conductive wood, you have a 50% chance of hitting non-conductive wood when you tap. And as this will kind of shows, again, this um, underscores how much tree diameter growth underlies all of this, because it is the diameter growth that determines how much new conductive wood is added to the outside of that tapping zone each year. And as it does that, the existing non-conductive wood gets out of the tapping zone. So the deeper it is in there, it's basically the conductive wood is growing out the tapping zone and the non-conductive wood is no longer within the tapping zone. So it is gonna determine ultimately the proportion of non-conductive wood that's present and the chances of tapping into it. And why does this matter? Well, because tapping into non-conductive wood impacts yield. And again, this is something that of course we all already know, but also again, this is something that is uh, much more informative to put an actual value on. And so this is a brilliant study done by my colleague, Mark Isselhart, where he intentionally tapped into brown wood, uh, stained previous um, areas that were from previous tap holes, and quantified the yields from the tap holes made into stained wood. And what he found in this study was that trees ta or tap holes put into non-conductive wood into previous stains yielded approximately 75% less sap. So it's not just that we run the risk of getting a little less sap when we tap into non-conductive wood. This is a substantially lower amount of sap than we would get than from when we drill into nice clean wood. Now, of course, the reduction in yield you get is going to be to increase the more brown you hit. So if you just kiss the side of an old tap hole, then perhaps uh, you know, you, you'll get probably more yield from that tap hole versus one that you drill directly into the staining column. But overall, it was an average of 75% less. So that's a lot. So the greater the chances you have of hitting non-conductive wood, the greater chances you have significant reductions in yield. And that is why it all matters. So before we talk about how to kind of put this all together, there are just a couple other things that I want to mention. And one, big one is related to tree size. So again, we all know that in general, the yield increases with increasing size. And from the results of a number of different studies we've done, it's roughly about a half pound per inch in diameter up to much larger sizes where you would see, you know, be adding to taps. There's a lot of variation in this, as we all know. Um, trees yield different things for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I put this in here to highlight, first of all, that small trees, the yields from smaller trees are not very big. Skip that for now. And in addition to that, the relative percent of non-conductive wood in the tapping zone increases with decreasing tree size. So you put the same tap hole in a smaller tree and that non-conductive wood is a much higher proportion 
of the tapping zone than it would be in a larger tree. This makes non-conductive wood accumulate much faster. And this is just a picture to show sort of how easily that can happen, um, how small, how uh, easily non-conductive wood can accumulate in a small tree. And oftentimes, I mean, this is pretty extreme, but you can have something like this in a small tree. Um, every tap hole that was ever been put in there is interacting at one is a little extreme. It's kind of pretty too. Anyway, the other factor to consider with small trees, not only do they have small yields, um, but they also, the trees that we're tapping on the smaller end do often tend to be lower down in the canopy. So not main co-dominant or dominant trees, but subdominant, intermediate, depressed. And in our original study, we actually measured some of the growth rates of those suppressed and intermediate trees. And these are in blue compared to the co-dominant and dominant neighbors in orange. And you can see that even at the same sites, those, the growth rates of those trees are much, much lower. And so if you have slower growth rates, this is going to basically exacerbate your already really rapid non-conductive wood accumulation from a tree that isn't yielding you much sap in the first place. So it begins to kind of conjure in your mind images of chainsaws instead of your tapping drill. So just kind of keeping that in mind. So ultimately, you know, I give a lot of presentations on research that we're doing to give you tapping practices to maximize the yield you can get from trees. And that is absolutely true. But really the big picture is that when we say tapping practices to maximize yield, we need to mean maximize yield for the long term. Because essentially our tapping practices today, because they reflect and determine the non-conductive wood accumulation and how much that's going to change over time, depending on the growth rates and tree factors, basically they are going to determine the uh, yields that we're able to get in the future. So really when we talk about maximizing yield, what we really want to say is we want to optimize yield, the best possible yields that we can get today to ensure that we have the best possible yields in the future too. So question, how do you do this? And the first thing, first things first, is to know something about both the growth rates of your trees and also the amount of non-conductive wood that's present in your trees at that moment. And so to get an idea of growth rates, a really simple thing to do is just measure the diameter at a marked location on a subset of trees in uh, the different stands in your operation, or you can get fancy and establish permanent plots. But by doing this, and you can mark the location with paint. If you're organic, um, talk to me afterwards. I can give you a couple suggestions. But if you're not organic, you can use forestry paint. Um, and basically just measure the same place every year. And pretty rapidly, this will give you a good idea of how the trees in your stand are growing. And then the other really important thing to do is to estimate the frequency that you're tapping into brown wood when you tap. So are you hitting brown wood 10 out of 100 tap holes? Are you hitting it 20 out of 100? What is it? This gives you a lot of good data to make good decisions on, as we'll see in a moment. And I'll skip this in the interest of time. Okay, so after you know something about what's going on with your trees, and really before you even know that, first things first, you want to do anything you can to promote the growth and health of your trees. So what that means in lots of cases is some thinning and other forest management to encourage the growth of crop trees. This can mean liming or other soil amendments um, if they're needed. So getting a soil test, uh, consulting with a professional to see um, is growth of my trees limited in some way by something that I could add. And then other basic best practices. So you know the best uh, thinning job in the world is really not doing you any favors if to do it you messed up the base of like half of your crop trees with bad logging. So kind of keep that in mind. Good rows, uh, uh, soil compaction, like all those other issues that we sometimes take for granted really do have an impact on the way that our crop trees grow. So it's good to keep in mind. So once we do that, 
The next thing is that we're gonna choose practices and adjust them that balance the accumulation of non-conductive wood that we're gonna have and the yields that we want with what's going on with our trees. What can they tolerate? What's going on with the growth rate? How much non-conductive wood is already there? How frequently are we hitting it? So the first thing that we can do to adjust is to adjust practices that don't impact our current year yield. So there's a lot of tools in our toolbox that we can get better yields over the long term without impacting the yields this season. And most of these, or all of these really, have to do with increasing the effective size of the tapping zone. So the larger the tapping zone there is, the more conductive wood we have to start with. So it basically tips the scales in our favor. And the simplest way to do this is simply by increasing the length of the drop line, which we have total control over. Um, and of course, you can also move the lateral line system vertically, especially in areas where there's snow, uh, that a little easier to do than um, in other areas, but that can also be done. But drop line length is a super simple way to decrease the amount of time you're hitting uh, non-conductive wood when you're tapping. And so I'll take you back to the original study I talked about where we had so many of those trees that were below the estimated minimum growth rates. And in that, uh, the tapping practices we were using um, included a 30 inch drop line. When we did the same analysis, but used a 36 inch drop line instead, instead of 27 to 40% of the trees not having growth rates that were good enough, we dropped that down to eight to 27. So really significantly reduced that simply by adding six inches to the drop line length, which is a pretty significant change, and it did nothing to reduce our yield in the current year. Then uh, obviously a really good choice, especially if you have a heavy buildup of non-conductive non wood above the lateral, is to tap below the lateral line. That effectively doubles the size of your tapping zone. And our research has shown that there is no difference in yields from tapples that are placed above that are placed above the lateral versus below the lateral, as long as best practices are followed. So really good attention to leak checking, good vacuum levels, um, good spout placement, and good sanitation. So in this um, you know, these studies show there's no difference in yields. So you don't lose anything by tapping below the lateral, but if you have a substantial proportion, like if you're hitting lots of brown wood above the lateral, you may actually see a boost in yields the first couple of years you tap below the lateral because there's such, you're hitting non-conductive wood so much less frequently right off the bat. All right, and so once those are taken care of, then you can move on to, if needed, practices that can impact the current year yield. So practices that affect how much non-conductive wood is being added, but also impact yield. So adjusting tapping depth, the diameter of the spout, and of course the number of taps per tree. And taking it back to, again to that original study, when we went one step further and changed our tapping depth from two inches to one and a half inches, now all of those same trees that we originally had such a high percentage that were didn't have growth rates that were good enough by just adjusting those practices we were down to between one and eleven percent having growth rates that were not good enough so very simple changes led to much improved sustainability and now we know much improved yields over time not just in the first year all right so in the real world if you are you've got a situation where you your trees are growing slowly you're hitting non-conductive wood maybe five or 10% of the time, you know, obviously the first thing you're gonna to wanna to think about is doing some thinning or forest management activities if they're needed. And then next you would move to increasing the drop line length, maybe tapping below the lateral, reducing the number of taps per tree. We can see that, especially at smaller diameters, that may not even reduce your current year yield by very much at all. And then if necessary, go to a slightly shallower depth, go to a smaller spout diameter and see what happens. And then adjust over time as your trees start growing better, as you're hitting non-conductive wood less and less, you can go back to a deeper depth. You can go to a bigger spout. 
Uh, it's something that needs to be constantly monitored and adjusted based on what your trees are doing and showing you. So ultimately, it, in order to maximize yields, we need to ba basically make sure that we're choosing the tapping practices that balance yields and sustainability because it's our current tapping practices that are going to determine our future yield. And oh, I'm going to throw this in there if I have time. Let me just check. Okay, this is a numerical example, and this comes courtesy of Tim Perkins, who is the only person that could make a graph like this and actually understand it, but I'll try and do my best here. But it puts some dollars and cents on all of this. So give me a moment. So in 2017, we were hitting at the Proctor Center stain wood about four and a half percent of the time. So four and a half tapples out of every 100, which we thought was excellent because it was much better than it was in the past. When we learned from Mark's study just how much sap we were losing from that, those tapples, Tim calculated it and realized that across our 5,000 taps, we were losing about 70 cents a tap with uh, hitting that level of stained wood. We adjusted some other practices, got our percentage of stain down to 1%, so one tapple out of every 100. That reduced the loss to 15 cents a tap across our 5,000 taps. So in other words, like doing the math, we were losing, or we are no longer losing $2,800 just by reducing the number of uh, the, the number of tapples that hit brown wood by three and a half percentage points, twenty eight hundred bucks a year. So it's a it's a difficult graph. I still don't understand how it says that, but it does say that somehow. But the numbers make sense. Twenty eight hundred dollars is a very significant amount of money for three and a half fewer tap holes that hit brown wood out of 100. So um, I think I, maybe you've seen all of this before I can come back to this, but I think what I wanna do is just set on this slide right now and open it up to questions. Hopefully we have a little bit of time for that. Hopefully you guys have all stuck around because I have no idea if anyone's there. Yeah, they're still here, I can, I, we can tell. <laughs> Uh, great job, Abby. Uh, this is Mark Canell. I'm just gonna un I'm gonna give everyone the option to unmute themselves. I'd ask you if you're not asking a question to please stay muted. Cuts down on background noise. So give us a second. We're gonna give people the option to unmute and ask out a question, and then a reminder that the chat box is there as well. And um, and then another reminder. We do have a couple questions that people asked in advance when you re registered. Thanks for doing that. We can hit some of those now depending on what we get to, and we'll probably be posting questions back on the website we referred to. So there's an yeah, ask I, the team. I was gonna say, sorry, I just interrupted you for it. my mind, that a couple of the questions that we got ahead of time are little not covered in this talk, but could be covered in a later one. For those that I didn't get to, uh, or that are a little off topic, they will definitely go to ask the expert on Maple Manager. So. I see your questions, I have them, and I will answer them. Excellent. Um, so everyone, people can type in the chat box, speak up, uh, and if someone can't speak up, let me know by hitting the chat box, but I think everyone is unlocked right now. If Abby, you're un okay, Abby, good, we got somebody, yeah. Um, what do you know about tapping below the lateral line on on a natural vacuum, 316 is too big. Don't do it. Okay. Is that Mike Recklin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want to do tapping below the lateral without a pumped vacuum system. Uh, it would otherwise be very risky to do. I've got another one for you then, Abby. How, how, on your tapping below the ladder line, did you use check valves on those trees? Actually, we did both. Um, we did both with a standard spout below the lateral and with the check valve. And the yields were slightly better with the check valve, um, but it certainly is possible to do without. You, um, it's 
and uh, you get you buy yourself a little more insurance by having a check valve for sure, um, but you still definitely can do it without. I'm just looking at the list of questions to see if there are any that I could. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple in the uh, chat actually. Um, can somebody read those them? to me? I don't. Yeah, know. we can get them read for you, Abby. Yeah, that'd be great. So uh, Bob and Shar say uh, you did not mention random tapping versus a pattern on the tree or tap hole spacing. Do you have an impact? Do these have an impact on long-term yield? Uh, basically, looking at our analysis, we looked at it with a random tap hole placement, which isn't you know we're none of us are really randomly placing a tap hole. So by using some kind of pattern or uh, following a pattern, you can, um, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. And it, um, you can have a better idea that you're, especially when you know when exactly you started tapping those trees, you can definitely have a better idea that I'm not going to hit non-conductive wood with this tap hole. So it can be really great. It's really important um, to, not just have the pattern in mind when you're top when you're tapping uh you know to still actually look at the area where you're tapping and not just be focused on i'm going to do x amount of distance up and down um, but in terms of sustainability it if done well it could certainly i don't want to say that it can help because ultimately you're still adding the same amount of uh, non-conductive wood to the tree but it can certainly reduce your chances of hitting it if you do it well all right, and Matthew Fisher asks, does the double tapping test reflect tapping one tap above a second tap or two taps at different locations around the circumference? Good question. The two tap study was two taps um, totally opposite of one another and actually uh, vertically offset too to try and minimize that tap hole cannibalization that we talked about. Another one from the chat box, Kate Photos asks, when data starts coming from your 15 external sites, what site-based factors will you look at in terms of impact of yield, if any? Well, we won't have, unfortunately, data on yield from those studies because they're all um, on, we don't have chambers for all those different sites, uh, but we will look at uh, soil, uh, soil fertility, soil tap, um, basically what's available for the trees, um, and kind of losing my train of thought there, but basically site elevation aspect, um, but the big one is going to be soil. That's all I see in the chat so far. I have a question. Uh, uh, from uh, in regard to uh, uh, the uh, tapping of trees, uh, some of the work that's coming out of Cornell, uh, retapping. Uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of producers that if they get into a tough season, they feel very uh, confident going out and bumping taps and tapping, retapping trees to try to get more sap. Uh, what is your opinion on that? And uh, what exactly is there anything in lieu of the work that's being done at Cornell? Uh, yeah, what is actually, um, that you you set set me up for my next presentation, Les. That's great. So <laughs> we just finished uh, three Go ahead, years. <laughs> and so that, that I you got my email before ahead of time. Great. So uh, tossed me a nice softball there. So we have uh, we just finished a three year study looking at some retapping strategies. Um, and, uh, my, that, well, so stay tuned. I'll give you those results in, in October okay. at the next uh, presentation. But my overall sort of broad opinion on retapping is that it can vary widely depending on the situation at hand. You know, are we talking about apples drilled really early and then kind of refreshed, earlier in the season or just slightly later in the season 
or just catching that last five day or last couple of runs. I think it really depends. And I think the results of all of our work at Cornell and here and elsewhere kind of reflect that. We see kind of a, a smorgasbord of results depending on the very varying conditions that we can do that in. What I do know, hands down, whether we get more sap yield or not, we are definitely adding more non-conductive wood when we do it that way. The nuancy question of is it worse when we hit it twice than just once is difficult, but in general, the volume will be bigger if we're refreshing the hole, and we have to take that into consideration. You know, look at all the factors that we just looked at, take that into consideration. Can my tree take that and still get me yield uh, five, ten years from now? Am I getting an extra, you know, gallon or two of sap to, and I'm uh, sacrificing gallons and gallons of syrup in the future by doing that? No disagreement here. Thank you, Abby. In Ohio, it's probably totally different. <laughs> so, Abby, we have another question. Uh, Aaron Stack asks, when thinning an area around a tree, is there a radius or diameter or other tree count to use as a guide? I am going to punt that question, Aaron, to um, a couple of resources right now. Actually, I'm going to punt you to the forestry section of Maple Manager. <laughs> there are a number of resources there. There are a lot of different um, guidelines for how to thin around a crop tree. And so stay tuned both for resources from this team and the new North American Maple Producers Manual for some guidance there. But in the meantime, the best answer I can give you is to work with a forester because the answer to that question like super depends on a lot of other factors that um, you can be on the ground that I can't just uh, that we can't account for just talking about it theoretically. Abby I just want to let you know we're just a couple minutes after eight o'clock so um, uh, I think we should we can thank everyone that's attended this far thus far and then I wanted to ask Abby if there are any more questions do you want to stay on for a couple more minutes? Yeah, I am happy to stay on for as uh, as long as until they boot us off happy to stay on for any questions that people have I'm here. Okay great well I'll just so let's, let's, let's if any, yeah if anyone needs to, to, to take off we'll definitely remind you to go to go to Maple Manager dot org and you'll see more of the questions pop up that we didn't get to during the session while you were on and um, we'll just open it up and maybe go five more minutes and see what we get. Mark again I'll just speak up Abby we may need to get those resources on Maple Manager I'm not sure that we have any guides posted yet in the forestry section so if you could uh, share them with Mark, Tom, and I in the next day or two, we can get them posted. It's it's mostly what I'm referring to are existing resources that we can link to. Perfect. That that we just need if we can get the links, that'd be great. Hopefully, Mark's not about to kill me. <laughs> I'm just going to scan through the other questions to see if I have any that I can answer the ahead of time questions. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So one question is, how do you know when to tap? And that's a little like slightly off topic from today, but in general on a vacuum collection system, what we see is that there really is no too early. Um, you definitely, you, with higher levels of vacuum and good sanitation, you can really maximize the length of your season. So there's not as much of a risk in tapping early. How do you know when to tap on a gravity system is that is totally above my pay grade. That one is a complex <laughs> question with lots of different good answers. So um, if you are the person that asked that question and you want to speak up and ask a more nuanced version of that question, I'd be happy to answer. Along those lines, Abby, uh, what uh, what are you seeing when you say it's not it's not too early to tap? Uh, there has to be a 
a trigger mechanism in a tree that, you know, obviously October's going to be too early. Um, November may be too early. But with the change in climate, as we move forward and we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, unfortunately, a couple of the uh, sessions that were Southern SERPs that was, that was canceled and so forth this year, we were hoping to get into that with a climatologist from uh, Ohio, changing and showing the dynamics of the change in that, in the climate. Is there a time if, if I've had producers say, hey, you know, maybe we ought to be tapping in December. Well, can we, can we, push, can we push the, the too, too quick? Yeah, so there's two different things going on. And so one, so obviously we need to have no leaves on the tree to tap. And we need to have fluctuating above and below, uh, fluctuating above and below the freezing point temperatures. So technically we know we can tap as soon as that happens in October. So those conditions are met. What hasn't happened at that point is the tree hasn't gone through winter dormancy and exited winter dormancy. And both of those play a role in how much sugar is going to be in the sap and ultimately how much tapping and sap collection are going to affect the tree physiology. But if you put all of that aside, the <laughs> all that you know pesky tree physiology stuff aside, um, from a purely practical standpoint, we know that you can tap, uh, put in a tap hole in October, in November, in December, and maintain its viability without refreshing for the uh, bulk of the production season without significant losses. Not no losses, but it is possible. And if I was someone in a climate like Ohio, um, it is far more, mm, let's say, it could be seen as far more reasonable to be tapping in a December time frame to catch lots of those above, the, lots of those good sap run periods that are happening in late December and early January, if you have high levels of vacuum and you're in Ohio, that is going to significantly help your yields without potentially cutting in over much into the tree's early uh, experience of the dormant season. Thank you. Yeah, that one, we'll cover that one too in my talk in October. Everybody come. So Abby, there's a couple of very nice comments uh, in the chat about the presentation. Uh, a comment from Mark saying, check out Ask the Team. And then Joelle asks, is depth of the tap hole including the bark? Ah, in these studies, in the tap hole depth studies, they is, did not factor in the bark. So it was as a, as a normal producer would do it, two inches to two inches. All right, the chat is clear at this point. All right. Well, I think it's uh, about 10 after it, probably a good time to wrap up, so. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Abby. Thanks.